Let's text the old boy. I'm going to get sarcastic with him. Hang on a second. You said you were almost ready. Period. That was a long time ago! Exclamation point. I'm dictating this out loud. Onto the microphone, into the microphone, onto the camera. This will put a trip on him. Let's get your act together. <laughs> this is an opportunity to get on Stan's case. I love this job. Hey, there's Stan saved me. There he is. There he is. There he is. Hi, Stan. <laughs> What's up, Marshall? Did you get my texts? I did. We're totally cutting that out. <laughs> I recorded them. I know. <laughs> um, Marshall, I was preparing. Of course, we're 10 minutes in. <laughs> oh, man. 10 minutes. I'm sorry. I have so much to say. That's all that means. Well, I think we should get started. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Stan, we did a uh, podcast just a bit ago that was about a book by David and Ted, David Bales and Ted Orland, called Art and Fear. Do you remember that? Yes, we just did that about an hour ago. You don't need to say when. <laughs> anyway, we did that and we were kind of critical of that book and you were particularly critical toward the end about how out of touch it was with the 21st century because they were addressing problems of the 20th century where you had to have a bigger entity give you an audience to the world. And now that isn't the case anymore and I figured somebody should rewrite that book or if not rewrite it. They should... In, they should invite some young person who has capitalized on this to instruct, to shepherd those who are following in the wake of social media and what it can do for your career. And I would like to nominate and even elect <laughs> Stan Prokopenko. Wow. Is this a democracy or, or monarchy? This, this is a, yeah, this is a, what do you call it when the old people make the decisions? Uh, I don't know. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Doesn't make any difference. This, what, what we're going to talk about today has nothing to do with the Art and Fear book. Um, it's it's kind of what it was missing, but also the stuff that we're going to talk about wouldn't get put into that book. It's simply to say that the, 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 the social media, the internet made a lot of the things that they brought up as problems irrelevant because they're not problems anymore. Um, and now we're going to talk about how to navigate that social media and, and, and the internet to your advantage. Um, but I'm not going to talk about how to create your art. I mean, th this is what, that's what Art and Fear was about. How to make your best artwork, how to sit down and get to work in the first place. This isn't about that at all. This is just about, hey, you have this tool, here's how you use the tool. This can be valuable. This yeah. is the kind of thing that I don't know much about and I rely on you for and you are doing it as well as anyone I know. So, I'm here as a student. Okay. Well, so I'm not an expert on this. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm not an expert. I, mean, <laughs> I beg to differ. Okay. Compared to you. <laughs> well, when you're going to keep your standards low. My longest standing advice for social media uh, has been to put out quality content. Um, and that's, that used to be like my only advice. <laughs> people will be like, how do you get people to view your stuff? I'll say, well, make good stuff and then people will share that stuff. Let your work speak for yourself. And that's still true, but there's a lot more to it. I mean, social media is a, is a huge industry and it's complex now. As Facebook would put it, it's complicated. Isn't there a book by uh, Michael Hyatt called Platform that young people have tried to get me to read and the first thing in that book was have a killer product? I don't know. I haven't read any books on, um, on social media. So, <laughs> again, I'm not an expert. I haven't done that much research. I've only learned on the field. I've only done, I've, I've gotten experience on the job.
Well, I never got past the first point in Michael Hyatt's book because I didn't have a killer product yet. So I figured, okay, well, I got to get that taken care of first. Yeah. This was your, your this was your advice too, and this was your philosophy. Yeah, is make the product good. That was where you started. Uh, I take that back. I read a part of Jab 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 Right Hook uh, by Gary V. Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and actually, man, I didn't even write down any of the, his advice from that book into my notes. <laughs> well, tell tell us what you remember about it. Oh, yeah, the the big the big point that I remember from it is uh, the the jab 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 refers to the free stuff you give away to people. You're you're giving them this free tutorial. You're giving them this little tip. You're sharing your artwork, and they like it. And then and you develop this trust with your audience. And then the right hook is the thing you sell. <laughs> you're rolling your eyes. It's true though. Marshall. It's, it is such a Gary Vaynerchuk kind of thing, though. <laughs> it's a it's a me against my audience. No, it's not. What do you mean, me against my audience? The the the, the metaphor is a me. Uh, uh, it's what when they aren't suspecting it. I'm gonna wham. I'm gonna hit, give them a right. No, hand. I don't think Gary Vaynerchuk is against his audience at all. Okay, okay. It just I I I I don't like the analogy. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. You don't have to like the analogy, but th his whole point is s stop right hooking. <laughs> Stop selling so much. Give them something. Give them a reason to even follow you in the first place. Um, it's more about taking the focus away from the right hook and focus on the jabs. Focus on building your audience in a, um, in a genuine way so that they actually like you and follow you and you give them value. And then once you have that, sure, you can ask for a favor. It's, it's no different from a friendship. Right? You give, you give, you give, and then when you're in need, you ask for a favor and your friends are there for you, the real friends. Okay. <laughs> right? It's no different. Okay. It's not like you against people is friendship. Okay. Sorry, I, I locked on to the, uh, the, the analogy. Anyway, that's the big point though is stop focusing on selling so much. Make sure you're providing more value to people than you're trying to take away. Yeah. And in general, you'll, you'll be successful if you do that. Give to the world more than you take from the world. Well, I see that. I see that in what you've done because the free content for the anatomy course and the free content for the figure drawing course was was uh, plentiful. Yeah. Yeah. That was by design. Well, no. <laughs> it was an accident. It was before I read the, his book. It was before I had got that advice. It was I started giving stuff away for free because I didn't feel like I could charge it. I didn't feel like I had an audience to even sell to. Um, this was before YouTube was big. I, I, I was just doing blog posts and putting them out for free and trying to get, grow my name to sell my artwork. Shit. So, I was trying to sell something. <laughs> you were instinctively <laughs> doing it before you ever read Gary V's uh, book. Geez. Uh, okay. <laughs> You're right again, uh, I'm with you. You win. I'm with you. You keep no. right hooking at me. <laughs> Man. Where do we go from here, man? Let me make sure I understand this. The first thing is quality. Have a killer product. Yeah, quality. Quality will will definitely make it easier. How about that? Uh, if your if your art sucks, you're gonna start doing things like spamming other people's comments, saying things like "Please follow me," "Check out my profile," because that's all you have. You, you can't grow organically. But if you focus on quality, other people will follow you and then they'll share your work because it's good enough to share. And then marketing becomes so much easier. You won't have to pay for advertising because you get word of mouth advertising, which is way better than paying for advertising in my opinion. But I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Okay. The first thing you have to do, you got to make sure you have a clear objective on what you're doing on social media. What's the point here? You, you can't just go on there and just start doing stuff. Um, you're going to get confused. You're going to get uh, distracted <laughs> by social media. I think that's your biggest fear, right? By social media is that it's a distraction. It's a time suck, yeah. You can fall down that rabbit hole. Anytime you open up Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, whatever, you start scrolling through the feed because that's the first thing that pops up is your feed. Because the app is made for consumption, not for creation. 
So, you have to have an objective with what you're doing in social media. Um, and for us artists, usually the objective is to grow an audience, get our artwork out there um, and create. We have to go into each app in creator mode. If you habitually open the app to check up on stuff, that's no good. There are times when that can be good but again, you have to go into that with an objective. For example, when do I open it as a consumer? Sometimes if I have a few minutes, I'm waiting and I feel like, okay, I'm going to scroll through my feed and I'm going to just go through and I'm going to um, see what I really like and I'm going to bookmark those things because everything I really enjoy gets published to the Proco TV Instagram which is a curation of the things I like. So, I have an objective there. I'm not just mindlessly going through and just looking at stuff. My objective there is to grow my Proco TV Instagram which is curation of good stuff and people follow that to see good stuff. Um, so, that is one example where it's okay but again, again see that's it's I'm kind of creating something as well. Curation is a kind of creation, right? No? You're organizing resources and researching in a way, yeah. You can commu confuse yourself, distract yourself but you can also confuse your audience. You know, people will follow you if they go onto your profile and they know exactly why they should follow you. If it's all over the place, they don't know what you are, what you do, they might leave after 30 seconds because it's just, that's how things are on the internet now. It's just split decisions. So, you got to instantly hook them. Have a brand with every part of your profile, your, the description of yourself, your little bio, uh, the profile picture, the way you organize your posts, everything should communicate to your a, a new follower or a potential follower why they should follow you. Um, and there's many things you can do to increase that chance that someone will follow you. Uh, but first is an objective. You need to know why they follow you. If you have a clear goal of yourself and your brand, you can start from there and make all these decisions. Um, one big tip on that is don't post too much random stuff. I've made that mistake a lot. Um, my, my content hasn't been super focused. I experiment maybe too much. Um, now, that, that can be good kind of but the, the artists that I see that grow the most on social media are the ones that are super focused on one thing and they give their followers exactly what they expect, exactly what they follow them for. Now, people like Loish come up, it's like her style is her style, people love that style and every post, they get it. The person who's going there, they know what they're going there for. Mm -hmm. And so, you're meeting their expectation with some surprises but it's always yeah. along what they're expecting. So, yeah, this is a way to serve them. You can have some surprises. Of course, there's a balance there but um, it's pretty easy to lean on the random stuff, you know. You, mm -hmm. you, you see your friends who are, might not be creators, they're full-on consumers are posting food pictures, posting pictures of their, their, their family, pictures of them doing random stuff. Like, sure, if you're using social media as a way to connect with your friends, that's absolutely fine. That, that, that's a way you can use social media but you can have a separate profile for that and I, I actually recommend that. I also made that mistake <laughs> on Facebook which is why I personally don't use Facebook anymore. You have two separate profiles, one for Proco and one for you personally? I do now but it's, it's too late. Like, uh, I, I, I use my personal Facebook. I mean, I, I, get, well, I got on Facebook in 2004. That's the year it started. <laughs> And so, back then I wasn't thinking about this stuff to separate my professional work from I didn't even really have professional work. 2004 is when I graduated high school. Um, and so, my personal profile was my professional profile and at one point I reached the maximum of 5,000 followers or friends on Facebook and my feed was just, it was bombarded with all this random stuff everybody was posting who I really didn't really care about personally. I didn't know them. They're, they were following me or trying to be my friend because they wanted to follow my artwork but I didn't really want to follow them but on Facebook you had to be friends with them and which goes both ways. You see their stuff and they see your stuff. 
And so, I stopped using Facebook for personal stuff because I wasn't seeing any of my family and friends stuff. I was just seeing all these, uh, these viral videos of, uh, of ra- just the stupidest stuff. The stuff that gets clicks and, and shares but has nothing to do with what I'm interested in. Uh, and so, I, I haven't gone on Facebook because I haven't been able to clean that the mess. Wow. Okay. This explains so much. Yeah. I think if you go on my personal Facebook profile, I, I haven't posted in like, if you like the past two years, I've posted maybe three times. Uh, it's a mess. Um, but just kind of good. I don't go on social media for personal use. I, I don't get, I don't fall into that rabbit hole um, that a lot of people do. It doesn't, it's not a time suck for me. That's good advice. Is it's the difference between producing and consuming? huge difference it's, it's two it's like opposite things so don't don't yeah. combine them so if you are going to post a lot of things for your family and friends to see don't mix it with your uh your professional profile which is basically your portfolio nowadays it is mm-hmm. it's where a lot of people get jobs is they get discovered by someone scrolling through the new you know their news feed and somebody shared something and it happens to be a post that you did uh, and there you go. So someone d- hires you. Um, I think Knight Knight was saying that's how she gets jobs, right? Right. Yes. It, it's very normal now to so it is your portfolio. Treat it like your portfolio. Okay. But <laughs> there's a balance to that, and it depends. It also depends on what your objective is. For me, my personal identity is part of my brand. It's not just about my artwork, right? Like I'm a, I'm an instructor. I make uh, videos on YouTube. People think of me as their teacher. I'm part of the brand. It's not just about yes. my artwork that I'm creating. And so, yes. if you want to be someone who people uh, follow, not someone who makes artwork that they follow, then you have to put yourself into your posts. You have to show your face. You got to make be personal um, because the internet is kind of made for that. People like people and people like feeling like they're your friend, (laughs) especially on YouTube. If if we're talking about YouTube as a social network, that's super important there. You you can't really get away from that. Um, People Mm -hmm. follow people on YouTube. That makes sense. So, every once in a while, I'll post a picture of uh, me and Cooper and it makes me human. People like that. And those posts actually get a lot of likes, you know. Not that it really matters, but it just it just means that my followers are okay with me posting that stuff every once in a while. Um, if I start flooding it with that, they'll I'll probably lose a lot of people. And again, not that that matters that much, <laughs> but if if I don't want to lose people, then I don't do that. Or I do that somewhere else. And also it makes a difference what kind of pictures you post. You've got a beautiful kid. And uh, you did you did that that picture where you had Cooper in the place where they had the cameras all around him. Oh yeah, well that was yeah that was very uh, appropriate for what I do as well. It was also such a great picture that I have shown it in classes as an example of it's it's a class it's a science fiction picture. Yeah. It's an amazing. Thing so yeah that was that was a picture that even if I didn't know you I would I would still want to show that picture to sh- to show a remarkable juxtaposition. What Marshall's referring to is I I got Cooper three D scanned, <laughs> um, which involves having I think it's like one hundred and twenty DSLR cameras in this ball shaped dome around a middle point. Point, pointing all at this midpoint in the middle of the dome and they all take a picture at the same time and then there's software that takes all those pictures and is actually able to create a 3D object because it, uh, you know, it knows what the thing looks like from every angle pretty much. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> so, yeah, seeing this baby in the middle of this dome made of cameras, is, it's, it's very strange. <laughs> yeah, it looked like something out of a Kubrick film. And then we we uh, we printed three D printed that as well. Like actually, Christian printed it for me. It's really cool. We have it on my bedside. Well, that was that was a picture worth getting around. Yeah, and it's very much related to art as well. You know, three D 
printing. But I I don't just post that. It's just like, here's a picture of my son. I, I Like this weekend, it was his birthday and I posted a picture of him in a bouncy house enjoying his birthday. But the last time I p- posted a picture of him was maybe a year ago. So, I don't do that very often. Now, we, we've got objectives that you're producing as opposed to consuming. There's some research that goes on here. There's a little bit of being in touch with what what's going on. Yeah. It's just having a clear focus, knowing what your audience wants. On YouTube, it's not just separating, you know, personal from professional. It's also staying focused on what kind of content you're making. Um, if your audience expects tutorials and then you stop making tutorials completely and you're just posting vlogs of you having fun, um, that might be different. Or th- th- that might, people might be like, wait, that's weird. Or if you start posting both things, you know, like I started, I did that a lot where I, I'm making tutorials but now I'm, it's a vlog. Oh, but now I'm also posting a podcast with you and me on that same channel and, and now I have other artists that are posting on my channel and people are, are confused and that has huh. limited my growth. I'm, I'm positive of that but I'm okay, I'm okay with it. Um, but like I said, people like Loish who are very clear in what they are and their, their focus, they grow much quicker. And okay. so, on YouTube generally the advice is like if you have lots of different types of content you're making, separate them into separate channels so people can follow them whatever they're interested in which is why we separated the podcast into its own channel, right? Okay. This I'm making notes on. Because, you know, the, the algorithm, man, it's that, that algorithm is what makes that uh, a thing. People who followed me for my tutorials will not watch my podcast. And so, when YouTube sees that a large part of my audience isn't watching all these videos that I'm putting up, they're going to start, it's going to hurt me algorithmically. But if I separate it and people who follow the podcast now watch the podcast and people who want the tutorials now watch the tutorials. YouTube sees, oh, okay, more, a larger percentage of that audience is watching each video. That's good. Okay, that's useful. That's very useful. And the next one was consistency, but I think it's pretty much the same thing. You're consistent with what you're, you put up. Uh, then, so, the next one then is frequency. Um, but actually, consistency goes along with that as well as like people need to know when you post things, like consistency in a schedule. Um, that, that is more related to YouTube, but it could also make sense on, on Instagram. You know, if people follow you and they know that they could see a new tip on Instagram, uh, or, or they know that you post something daily and it's useful to them, they'll check back with your profile daily to make sure that they're not missing something. With YouTube, it's even more relevant because it's like a show, it's like a TV show. If you post every week, people know that they, they make it part of their schedule and then it becomes a routine. And when it's routine, they're more likely to watch every single video. If you're posting randomly, sometimes you post four videos in a week and then you go a month without posting anything. There's no routine, there's no schedule, people don't make a habit of watching your stuff, they just come across it when it's up. Now, this is interesting because of the fact that the Internet allows you to schedule, to put things out there at any time and people can binge watch and because there's no limitation on that, it's a hearkening back to what we wanted back when the radio program came on at this time of night, back when the TV show was on at 8 o'clock p.m. on Monday nights and we would all arrange our schedule around that, that that seemed like such a limitation Then when you take it away, and then you start to want that because it gives your schedule consistency. It also allows you to amp up your feelings at the right time to say, oh, tonight, that's going to be. Okay, yeah, it was last night. We can talk about it today. It makes a lot of yeah. sense that it's tapping into – the consistency is tapping into something archetypal which is that you expect the sun to come up or the moon to come up or the seasons to be – have some predictability to them. Yeah. That's nice to know. And just I think the algorithm. <laughs> probably going to use that word a lot, uh, rewards that 
because just the, in the way it it's built, it uh, you know, if for example a video has a lot of comments on it in the first few hours, it's it's gonna perform a lot better than if it has a slow start. Um, there are on occasion weird weird things that happen where a video gets nothing for a year and then all of a sudden that video goes viral after like a year. Right. Uh, that that happens, yeah. but I, we're, in generally, a video will perform better if a large percentage of your audience watches it immediately. And so, okay. if they can expect your stuff at the same time and they have a habit of going to it at that time, most people will go onto the comments and start liking and watching and commenting, engaging with your content and the algorithm likes that. So, timing is important. Yes. For consistent timing and for striking when the match, uh, striking the match when it's ready to take that you want it so that right when this thing goes, it goes well. Yeah. And so, you release this podcast on Tuesday mornings. Is there a reason for that? It could be any day. It doesn't matter that it's Tuesday, but mornings, yes, that kind of does matter. Um, most of our audience is in the United States. Um, also Canada, but that's, you know, same time zones. Um, obviously, we have listeners from all around the world, but if you, if you look at it, it's like a very large chunk of it is in this time zone. And so, we want to release it right before everybody starts listening to it um, so that okay. the largest amount of people uh, get to it when it's published. Okay. Not like 20 hours later when they wake up the next day or something. I'm so glad you and Katie and John and <laughs> Sean and everyone else is there concerned with this. Th that's why when we publish like a YouTube video, we'll promote it on, on all the social networks right away. We'll send out a newsletter right away so that we get people as soon as possible onto that video. What else? Okay. Frequency. Yeah. Yeah. So, with frequency, you want to post more often <laughs> generally. Uh, there's bad things to that as well. Like, if, if you're posting frequently and your content is the quality is lower because you're trying to post more, that's not good. Um, I wouldn't lower quality to increase frequency. Uh, <laughs> so, keep that in mind. But if you can, for example, somebody like Carl Kapinski, just sketching all the time, he, I, he said something to me like, he used to think his sketches were, nobody would be interested in his sketches. It's like, who cares? He, they just want to see the final painting. But then he started posting his sketches that he does every day and people like those even more. Huh. Right? People, because his sketches are just so good though. That makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a difference. If your sketches really aren't that great, that's not going to work. Uh, focus on posting your higher quality refined stuff. Um, but it's okay to experiment. <laughs> so, he's able to post every day and keep the quality high. And he posts every day. Yeah, and he keeps the quality high. But I've actually, you know, I've noticed Carl posts a lot of older artwork. He, he reposts and it helps to have a large body of work to be able to repost so that people who see it don't feel like, I just saw that last month. Why are you posting that again? You know, he has thousands of sketches so he can take something from four years ago, post it again and people feel like it's new. So you, can, you can recycle stuff and keep people um, interested in that way. Yeah. You have a buffer. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you, you, so I'm just saying that you, you can increase frequency without having to produce more every day. Um, you could be creative with the kind of content you're, you're publishing and while still keeping it high. Okay. But it, it really depends on your brand and what, what you do. You know, Gary V publishes just... <laughs> He publishes so much every day, but you know, it's his team producing all the stuff, recycling things from all over the place, creating new content out of old content. Um, but that could be a full time job. Yeah. <laughs> so, templates and checklists make things faster for you. Explain. For every video, I have a meta, a meta doc that I just duplicate, and then in there is like, okay, what's the title of this video? What's the description? What are the keywords? What's the social media post? What's the email message? 
the idea is that you don't have to think things through yeah. anew every time. You, you have some things that are givens for everyone, which speeds things up. Exactly. And it's a template I go through and I'll, I'll fill in the blanks and my team can publish it for me as long as they, you know, I've approved all those things. Um, you don't have to think of each one as it comes up. You just go through it once. That's it. Okay. So, a template, a checklist of every social network you're going to publish this on. Maybe if, you know, if, if Instagram has a specific resolution that it likes with ideal ratio of width to height to make the image bigger, which is 4 by 5 by the way, um, that's the biggest image you can get on Instagram because if you go any taller, it starts to add... It has to shrink it down? Well, Instagram tries to make your images full width. So, if it's a square, uh -huh. it's full width. If it's even taller, it's still full width. And so, now a square versus something a little bit taller than a square, the square is smaller because something a little bit taller has the same width but now it's a little bit larger vertically. But as soon as you go more than four by five, um, it starts to add white edges on the sides or you, it'll crop the top or the bottom off and force it into a four by five. So, Instead of trying to figure out how to crop it while you're in Instagram, you could just have that laid out in Photoshop, open up your template, throw all your artwork in, create your slideshow with the same, with the same uh, ratio, makes it easier to post. It's done. You always are maximizing your, your screen real estate that way. Yeah, but you don't have to. Some paintings are horizontal, so. Yeah, good thinking. Yeah. It makes things efficient and, and you're, you're, it's making the space efficient and your time efficient. Yeah, but the point here is templates, yeah, efficiency of time, not necessarily screen efficiency. I mean, that, that's a, that can help but not necessarily. You can post a, a horizontal image and it'll still perform really well. Okay. I want to kind of go back to quality for a second because I didn't cover everything. If you don't think it's good enough, don't post it. Just because you, it's in your schedule to post something today. If you're not happy with it, don't put it up. Um, it's, it's more imp important to keep the quality high. Uh, I think I've told the story that like my first YouTube video that I published was not the first YouTube video I made. I didn't publish the first video I made. It was not that good. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Um, and along with that, if you posted something and then, you know, a few days later you think, oh, you know, that I really don't like that. Take it down. It's okay. Um, and another thing that I like to do specifically on Instagram is go through and archive old things that I think maybe they were timely. So, it's something relevant to just that specific week or something and now it doesn't matter. Archive it. Get it off of your feed of posts so that new people that come in that are scrolling to see if they want to follow you, they see only the best stuff. Um, I did that the first time was when I noticed that like a lot of my followers, they, they were liking my artwork, my drawings, my paintings, they were liking those a lot. But then I would post random things like Skelly and I like vid little videos of us interacting, making jokes, doing stupid things and that was part of my brand but people didn't really care, especially new people coming into my profile. They'd see the skeleton like, okay, who, what? What, what is this? I don't care about the skeleton. They want to, they want to see my artwork. And so, I went through and I, I, I archived a lot of that stuff and my profile seemed more like a portfolio and much more likely to get followed. Uh, in fact, I, I think I need to go back and do that. And just general professionalism, presenting yourself well. Um, so, take good photos of your artwork. You know, I... I, I <laughs> I think I've mentioned this already and this I, and I think I've mentioned it in the in the framework that if you're presenting your work to your teacher like to me or Marshall, uh, photograph it well so we can see it so that we can see that you're serious about your work and that you're serious as a student. If it's if it's in a dark room and it's all grainy and you're you it's from the side, I don't you know. It's obvious you're not being a professional here and it makes you look bad especially if this is like your portfolio and you're trying to sell yourself. So, take really good photos of your art um, but that's a whole other subject on how to do that. 
but generally people know what a good photograph looks like. And we did talk about that in the how to present a uh, how to put together a portfolio, present a portfolio last year. Yeah, a lot of that applies to putting together a social profile. Yeah, because it is a portfolio. Um, okay. Algorithms. <laughs> Algorithms. I've heard you use this word before. Yeah. It's a 21st century word. Yeah. So, it is important to, to look at the numbers, look at the analytics, see what's performing well, see what's not, and learn from it, but not worry too much about the specific numbers. There's a balance here. You, you got to learn big picture things here. If, um, if one post you put up doesn't do well, don't beat yourself up over it. It doesn't mean you suck. It just means that there's variety in your the stuff you're posting and one of them didn't do well for some reason. It might even have been out of your control too. Like something, something's going on in the world that makes you not really important right now. Everyone's focused right. on something else and so your posts aren't doing too well. Whatever, you know. Um, and don't beat yourself up over it and don't feel like you're a victim of the algorithm either. I see a lot of artists doing this. They're trying to chase the algorithm too much. They're super focused on that and they, uh, they are insulted by it. They feel like huh. if their posts aren't doing too well, um, that someone's out to get them. They start to lose courage and, and start to, to flounder because you've got an enemy attacking you when in fact that might not be going on at yeah, all. It's not, a, no, no one's attacking you. The algorithm's not treating you any differently. Um, <laughs> it's just, it might just be bad luck. Yeah. Or maybe your posts are getting worse and you just don't realize it. You know, maybe your audience isn't sharing your stuff as much anymore. And sure, yeah, the algorithm doesn't like that stuff. But th what's the root problem here? Why aren't people sharing your stuff as much? It's not because the algorithm hates you. It's because maybe your artwork isn't shareable, you know, as shareable as it was a few months ago. Um, so, there might be something you're missing. Part of what I'm hearing is to keep a cool head about this. By the time a person is this invested to where they are posting regularly, they are paying attention to algorithms and then things go wrong, you are pretty well invested by that time. So, you're going to start feeling like, oh, something's wrong and I put this much into it. But the idea is to not let that happen, to learn from it. Yeah. Objectively assess if you can and if you can't, wait for another few weeks to objectively assess. I mean, wait or, or focus on all of these other things. Focus on improving quality, engaging with your community, being more, more of what you are, whatever it is, um, instead of focusing on the, on the algorithm. It's like trying to lose weight and because weight will fluctuate a few pounds yeah. every 24, 48, 72 hours, you freak out that I gained a pound. Well, yeah, but you also lost 16. And to gain one back is not anything to be alarmed about because it's the general direction. It, things seldom go in a straight line. They're almost always likely to have fluctuations. So, this is something to accept and keep moving. And there are problems with the algorithm, sure. Like the, the algorithm tends to like spammy stuff that's very clickable. But that's not the market you're in, if you're an artist, you're not competing with that. Who cares? The algorithm will still treat you the same way it treats the other painter next door who's doing the same stuff. Not next door, you know what I mean. The, you know, the other painters that are doing the same thing as you, some of them are going to grow because they're doing something well and some of them won't. And then maybe it's because they're focused on the algorithm too much. Right. But again, it's a balance. You need to understand generally how it works if you want to gain followers. And all of this, all the stuff yeah. I'm saying is with the motive of growing your audience, by the way. It's not to be a better artist or anything like that. This is for growth on social media. The main thing I'm getting out of this is don't take your temperature every five minutes. Exactly. Unless there's a real problem. It's just you've got other things that are more important than chasing the algorithm. Notice it. Don't obsess over it. Yeah. And also, like, 
trying to get a million followers isn't also isn't the objective. The the goal is to have quality followers, the ones that actually care about you. Yeah. If you have a thousand followers, but they're very engaged, they're very involved in your work. Um, that's good. It's more. It's it's way better than five hundred thousand followers who, uh, really don't care that your account was all grown by by spam and bots and follow for follow. You know, th there's these these bots that you could set up that they follow other accounts randomly just so that that some of them might follow you back. It's like that that, that follower that just followed you back is probably doing the same thing. They're just following you because they're trying to grow their artificially grow the profile. If you grow that profile artificially to 500,000 followers, that's less valuable than a thousand followers who like you. That, that's steroid growth. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's not healthy. Um, so, don't game the system artificially. Try to interact with people as people, see what they want, see what you want to give them and be honest and, and be, uh, be genuine. Asking Marshall and I for help with drawing skills makes sense. But some life issues require a trained professional. If you're looking for a therapist, consider trying BetterHelp. BetterHelp takes the pain out of traveling to an office because everything is handled online. You can schedule appointments at your own time and in the comfort of your own home. Sessions are conducted by secure video or over the phone. Plus, you can chat and text with a therapist. A positive way to deal with the hurdles that life has to throw at us is to talk with a trained professional. And with over 3,000 US licensed therapists to choose from, you can find someone who will be able to help you out with depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleep disorders, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. And whatever you share is kept completely confidential between you and your therapist. Right now, BetterHelp is offering all Draftsman listeners 10% off your first month with discount code Draftsman. To get started, go to betterhelp.com slash Draftsman. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Draftsman. I like this. I'm learning. <laughs> I am. I know that you don't think of me as as involved in this, but I this part about quality followers yeah. and that you're okay with not having an extra million there. That's not the first priority. That is meaning a lot to me. It's helping me to put this in context. Yeah. But let's be real. Having a million quality followers is better than having a thousand quality followers. That's right. <laughs> so, but, uh, so, this stuff still matters. But again, it, the objective isn't just purely more followers. Hey, there is another thing yeah. now that I want to throw in okay. here. Seth Godin pointed this out that there was a, a woman who was playing music on a street corner and people would walk by, 90 some percent of the people would walk by and pay no attention. Yeah. But the fact that if there's just one percent that donate and that's enough to pay your bills, yeah, you've got a career in doing your music because there's just enough. And I've I've felt a, a good deal like that. I, I don't feel like I've been that ambitious. I've always felt like the uh, quality was more important than making more money. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you have to have money and you have to chase that. But the the an ideal life is to have enough money and to be doing something that you want to do with the people you want to hang out with. So, yeah, this, this does make sense to me. It's not the, the idea is not to get the biggest. It's to try to create the best if possible. Yeah. That's where it's speaking to me. That's when I'm, when I'm listening to this, that's the personal filter that it's going through. Yeah. So, I mean, along those lines though, like I think I mentioned it earlier is like, don't go around spamming other people's comment sections saying, check out my profile. I see that so often and I just cringe because it's like, they're they're wasting their time. Yeah, it alienates actually. Yeah, they're burning bridges. You know yeah, how many are. people are going to block you for just putting that comment in there? You just lost more potential followers than you've gained. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, and you do that on enough big people's f profiles, and those big uh, big people, and by big people, I mean like people who have a lot of followers. Um, you do that to all the 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 people that have a lot of followers. 
and they all block you, they'll never see your work again. <laughs> right. <laughs> Having one of those people with a lot of followers share your work because they like it is a big deal. Yeah. That could be a huge boost in your in your thing. So, don't do that. <laughs> What? It's like coming into a social arena saying, I'm looking for a long-term relationship. I got a lot of debt. I'm real needy. But hey, you know, if you want to connect with me, here I am. Yeah. It's like right away, everybody's like, I don't like you. <laughs> Get out of here. That's not what this is for. Um, plus, a, a lot of people are going to flag that comment as spam. And so, now you're, the algorithm hates you. <laughs> you're fighting against yourself. This should be common sense, but I, I think that sometimes a, a beginner doesn't know any better and they've got to either learn the hard way or they're going to listen to you. Yeah. And they're going to not make this mistake this week. Yeah. Or ever again. Right. I, I wanted to give an example of the numbers that people could dwell on. Um, I'm going to use my profile here as an example. Um, did you know that about, let me see here, the actual numbers. About... 1,300 people unfollow me every week. Is that right? Over 1,000 people yeah. unfollow, unfollow you every me. They take the time. They take the time to say no more of that. Unfollow. Boop. <laughs> Very okay. easy to get insulted by something like that and think like, oh my God, 1,300 people thought I did something wrong. They don't like me anymore. They followed me. So, they, they had an interest in, for some reason. And then I didn't provide. I, wow. I mean, some people will, will, could get depressed from that. Yeah. Right? Like, but you cannot dwell on that stuff. I mean, as long as the amount of followers you gained is higher than the amount of followers you lost, you're growing. You're fine. Plus- That is so rational. Think of it as you're gaining better followers. <laughs> Because the people that unfollowed you might have been unsure. They didn't love you. And so, it's a, it's a, a system of constantly keeping a smaller group of people that like you, that f are focused on your content. If those people who don't like your work stayed as followers, that would actually be bad for the algorithm. Because it means that a smaller percentage of people are liking your stuff and engaging with your stuff. I see. Wow, that's very good. Yeah, it's good to lose followers that don't like you. Wow. Because you've, now you've got a more concentrated group right. of involved people. It gets the people out of the party that aren't going to enjoy this party. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I have a friend who put a lot of energy into a job interview at a school and was very well qualified for the job and did not get the job. And I asked him how he felt about it. He said, if they don't want me, I don't want them. I thought, that's the, that's the attitude. Yeah. Right. And there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with them. You guys are just not aligning. That's okay. That's right. <laughs> Whatever. Good, good, good. Boy, that's a, that's, is, that is skin thickening. While we're on my analytics. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote down a lot of analytics. I have a, a chart of all sorts of stuff. You, you want to just cycle through them quickly sure. and, and then if some of them are worth, uh, worth unpacking, I'll, I'll ask questions. Yeah. One of the big ones that I wanted to compare is I have, two, I have two Instagram profiles. One is my personal profile, which I'm not so, I'm not very strict on it being personal. Sorry, not personal. It's my personal artwork profile. It's not like okay. my personal profile for my family. It's, it's, this is me. It's, right. it's called, it's Stan Prokopenko. That's the profile. The other one is Proko TV. That's where I curate. I don't post my own work on there. I post my favorite work on there by other artists. Okay. Things I discover. The Stan Prokopenko profile is eight years old. The Proko TV profile is two years old. Okay. The Stanford Kopenko profile has 287,000 followers, Proko TV 310. It's bigger. Okay. It grew bigger in two years than Stanford Kopenko in eight years. Eight years. Okay. There's a lot of things to unpack here though because it's like why? I, I feel like the reason is because of consistency of quality because I'm always posting things I really like and I have a very high standard of things I like. If it's okay, I'm not going to put it up there. I, I'm, I only post things I'm like, whoa, holy crap. 
If it doesn't make me think, holy crap, I don't post it there. So, the quality is always high on there. Um, All right. And also, the frequency is way higher. <laughs> so, I post there twice a day. I see. Twice a day. Whereas, on my Stanford Kopenka, I'll post like four times a week maybe. Sometimes, it's less. All right. Sometimes, it's more but usually, it's around like that. Maybe three to four times a week versus 10 or 11. Um, so, that like every post on there performs a little bit worse but because there's so many more posts, each one brings followers to my overall channel and it grows faster. So, that's just the way it works, you know. Um, generally, some, some people will gain a million followers only after a few posts because one of the posts went super viral got on the front page of Instagram or wherever and they just, they, they got on Ellen DeGeneres from this one post. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. there's other, you know, quant, sometimes quantity or quality can beat frequency but in general, if you're competing against yourself versus competing against other people, frequency will help you quite a bit. Uh, th and that's what this has shown me. I get less, way less engagement though on the Perco TV social network because my, I don't engage with the commenters. It's literally just a feed of work and it's not personal at all. Uh, when I post, it's an image and under the image I put, I tag the, per the artist, the original artist. And so, I'm actually driving people away from my post. I'm like, go to this artist. Um, and then I don't, I don't write anything else. I don't write my thoughts on it. And so, I'm not really asking for any people to respond to me in any way because um, I'm not providing a starter for a conversation. So, they get, they get less engagement. So, if you can combine the two, if you can combine frequency and engagement, I feel like the growth will be way faster than any of these. Well, that, that's useful. Yeah. And I think it's even more useful for people who are involved in this and they know they are experienced enough with this to have had their successes and failures and then to hear it from you. Yeah. And, and to confirm or challenge some of the things they've had. Yeah. Uh, Marshall, yeah. did you know that I wrote an algorithm? Well, I knew that you had done some coding. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I, I, an actual social algorithm for the new website. So, you wrote it. Yes. I came up with the algorithm for the new website that will come out some in the next how many months? I don't know, a year. Um, but you know how, I mean, you've seen the website. There's a news feed in, in your profile, and not in your profile, in your classroom. Uh huh. There's a news feed and it shows you posts. It's not chronological. There's an algorithm and I wrote it. And in I writing see. that algorithm, I, I did a lot of research on how other algorithms work. And it's uh -huh. really difficult to get away from frequency being uh, a, a big deal. Okay. It's, re it's really difficult to write an algorithm where frequency doesn't help you. Frequency weighs a lot in the equation. It's just how it is. The more you post, the more there's a chance to, for every post to bring in more followers. Well, there's something to be said for that that is, is useful in the difference between television and movies. People, students of mine that go into movie concept art, it's a whole different thing than television. Because with movies, you might have a year or two that you work on a movie because it's this long range project. As soon as you go into television, you have constant, it has to be on TV every week, there's constant movement. There's never a time to rest from it until you're between seasons. And so, people have talked about that phenomena as the tiger that you dare not dismount. If you're going to open up your social media, if you're going to be making your living from a frequency, then it means that your life will be arranged around it schedule-wise. Otherwise, you end up losing it. Yeah. Um, but watch out for about, you know, don't burn out. Don't burn out. I, uh, I think I see people getting super involved in it uh, and they spend too much time trying to post as much as possible and then they just, they get way too involved. They notice they're, they're not producing as much work anymore because they're, now they're just trying to stay involved in social media and then they burn out and then they just leave completely. That's not good yeah. too. That, that consistency goes away in that case. If you're just always leaving, you know, uh, close, you know, 
taking down your profile then coming back and taking it down again a year later and coming back and you're that crazy artist that everyone's like what is going on with this guy um so you know stay healthy keep analyzing if if it's weighing too much on you reel back the frequency it's okay keep the quality high and you'll still get growth it just might not be as quick but that's okay it's more important okay. to be healthy and not burn out than to okay. stay perfect with the algorithm. So, yeah, this, this is you've got a scale and you've got some frequency weighs very heavily, but there are several factors on any one side of the scale. Th those are the big things. There, there's a few like little side tips. Um, and, and I think a lot of these are pretty obvious, but I just see it all the time is like, don't put yourself down. Um, don't approach don't, don't let your brand be your imposter syndrome hmm. it's like you post them like uh, i'm not happy with this but you know it's okay or like oh it's having a rough day but just feel like posting um you know it this is again this is your portfolio and don't hedge don't say like you know, oh, I only had two minutes left over today and I did the sketch, whatever. It's like, okay, is it is it good? <laughs> you only had two minutes, but is it good? Like, if it's not, don't hedge to say it was only two minutes, so that's why it sucks. Eddie O'Connor calls that sandbagging. Sandbagging? Is that the same as hedging? I could have run that race much faster, but I had to carry this sandbag. Yeah. And so, it's a, it's a way to excuse what we did not do as well as we could have. Right. If it's bad, don't post it. And and also stop thinking everything you do is bad too. <laughs> you know, and if it is bad, but it's the best you've done, celebrate the the fact that it's the best you've done rather than I'm still not good enough. Okay. I know you're looking right into that camera at me. <laughs> what? Am I? <laughs> Wait, am I? No. I'm I wasn't. I'm teasing. I wasn't. I play, yeah, I, I know. I know. <laughs> but yes, I, I think that a lot of people have this happen. Yes. Did you have it happen? Because you don't seem like you had it happen much. You'll have to ask John because uh, he comes to me with, he'll like look through my archive of artwork and he'll pull something out and I'll be like, oh God, I hate that one. No, don't post it. And he'll pull another one and be like, no, 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 that one sucks too. Yeah. You got a truth teller on your team. No, I, I'm the one that says that. You, oh, he isn't the one saying no, he, it. You're the one saying he it. He pulls out stuff that he wants to post and he's like, is it okay if I post this? And I'm like, no, 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 that sucks. I'm like, no, no, that okay. one's, a, that one's really, that's even worse. And, and I don't know, like to him, he's just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, okay. You know, so maybe, maybe I have some of that, but I feel like maybe I just, I have an eye for it and he's not an artist. He's not a trained artist, so maybe he doesn't see it, but he's always telling me like, well, dude, this, this is fine. This is good. Like, we could post this, but I'm just like, no, don't post that. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know who's right in this case, but there's two sides of this. If it really does suck, don't post it. You don't need to post on a schedule if it's bad. Keep the quality up. But also, don't think everything you do is bad. I feel like I post enough, so. you Oh, you post enough. Yeah, this was a major point that Art and Fear made, which is that you've got to do lots and lots and lots of work to get that small percentage that is your best. It's been a constant theme with people who are realistically training creative people. That you cannot expect 100%. You can't expect even 50%. Yeah. You've still got to produce and produce as good as you as well as you can, but there has to be an understanding that your best will be your best, the smaller percentage. Yeah. Well, a lot of what I'm getting out of this is that there's multiple factors to juggle, multiple things to take into account. Yeah. But, but also just try to sell yourself all the time on there. Be positive about yourself. Don't, don't try to convince everyone that you suck. Mm -hmm. Okay. You post something that you might not be fully proud of, which, you know, how often are we fully proud of every single piece of our work? You know, we're usually going to see something we want to fix. Don't point that out. 
Because if you just constantly point out the bad things you hate about your stuff, then other people are going to start noticing those things too. Focus on the good, sell yourself. What's the point of ruining your work for other people that, are, that like your work? We are recipients of this knowledge. We will act on it this week and in the coming year. <laughs> this one's like the most obvious one, but I still, I still see it. Don't make your account private. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this restaurant. We've got the best food in the world. <laughs> I'm not serving it to anybody. My family and I though, what a great time we are having at dinner. Yeah. Don't you wish you were here? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, but you know, there could be something, there could be something about that though, that creates, you know, creates scarcity, you know? There, I, I feel like some accounts use that for, for that reason and they, mm -hmm. but people, people know that if they request access, they'll get it. So, your account is private but you have to request access to get into it but everyone is accepted. But then when it's like when you're in, you don't want to leave. <laughs> kind, kind of. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe it's a way of not losing followers but I don't, I don't like that strategy. I think it's kind of weird. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. But I do know some people who are really big on that, of, of creating scarcity is the way I've heard that it's been, that when it's hard to get, everybody wants it. Yeah. It's kind of like the underground bar, you know, it's a, you have to go through the phone booth and dial a specific number and then they ring you in and then you, you come down and then it's this bar that has really, you know, guys with mustaches and <laughs> twirling. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, I don't. But I, I, I no. But I've, I've got the idea from your picturesque description. This, this actually a big thing nowadays is to do that. But the thing is, like, it's so difficult to stay secret. It's like oh, secret hidden bar. But you go on Instagram and it shows you how to get in, or not Instagram. Sorry, yeah. you go on Yelp, right? And and it's like the first comment on there, the first review is like, go into the full booth and press three one four. <laughs> it's like okay, but it's 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 creating that that uh, forbiddenness of the prohibition days. Exactly, it's exactly what it's. It's that's why you've got somebody dressed in an archaic way. Is that this was there was a time when you had to do this secretly, and now that it's okay, we need to bring back some of that forbiddenness to give us the tang of hey, we're doing something outside of the mainstream. But I feel like nowadays it's more about the brand of having you feel like. You're getting into the secret thing. It's not actually about being secret. It's our club. Yeah. They're not actually like making their Yelp profile private so that they're not actually being found. Their Yelp shows exactly where they are. <laughs> There's photos of what it looks like on the inside. Their menu is right there. So, it's all about branding. A little bit of an initiation. Uh, but it's just funny. Like, there's people that'll, that'll message me and be like, can you look at my profile and... um. Tell me what you think and I'll click on it and it's private. And I'm like, oh God, okay. <laughs> and even, you know what's the, the funny is this, this is, I'm super confused by this. Some people will spam the comments and say, hey, follow me. And then you go to their profile and it's private. <laughs> that confuses me. I don't know what they're doing. It was not thought through. No. Or it was thought through very carefully <laughs> like the, the, you know, you know, the, uh, the, the things about spam that you get in your email that is is misspelled and you think it's because they're not bright. Do you know about that? Yeah, you, you think that they're not right, but they're just trying to sound human or something. No, they are. They are deliberately designing those things that have spelling errors, so that a person who doesn't notice those spelling errors, a person who's more oh. easily preyed on, will take that bait. That makes sense. But I still don't get the go follow me. Yeah. So, it, it, it's exactly the opposite of what we thought. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I don't think it works. Anyway, yeah, I might be giving them more credit than, than should. I, I think you are. Don't make your account yeah. private. Um, okay. I don't think people that want to hire you are going to appreciate your account being private. They're just going to leave. Yeah. It's like what if you go up to a, a, a studio trying to get a job. And then you're you're like ah, 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 ah. <laughs> you can't look. <laughs> nah, ah, ah. <laughs> that, will that make that them want to look? Our director will say, "Oh, come on, oh, please, come on, please." 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> please show me. <laughs> oh, man. Another one, uh, this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but uh, it's worked for me is collaborate with people. Um, it just, it helps to be relevant on, in, in many circles and you collaborate with someone, they promote you, you promote them, it helps everybody out. Yeah. yeah. Just collaborating with other artists is good. Just makes the world a better place too. Thing I hear people say when they hear that advice though is like, well, I, I only have, you know, a few thousand followers, how can I collaborate with someone? Well, you know, the, you know, there's more people with a few thousand followers that you can collaborate with than people with, uh, you know, a million followers. So, stop trying to collaborate with people who have a million followers and collaborate with people your size or slightly larger than you and you could still grow together and eventually you'll be in the category of 50,000 followers and you'll be able to work with them. I, I love that. I, I, that that's a, a, people used to call it, uh, maybe they still do, lateral movement where you'll go from this job to this job, not from here to here but from here to here and you might even take a cut in pay but you're going to have more opportunity for creativity or you might get a little more pay. Uh, but the idea is to not try to make huge leaps. I know there's a whole other approach to that, but that's what it is, is that you collaborate best anyway with people who are close to the same kinds of challenges that you've got. Right. Well, you've done that really well. You've, you, As far as collaborating and, and making connections, you've done it as well as anyone I know. That's been a huge one for me in, in growth is collaborating with other artists and bringing people to my my channel but also just because my my thing is mostly about education though you know not you know if you're an artist trying to promote your your work and not teach your audience stuff then that's kind of different um i mean you could still collaborate artistically with other people um and help yourself you know you can g gain followers or because you and the other person's audience align in some way and now you've shared followers. But to me, it makes more sense because it's like my audience wants to learn. Uh, and if I could provide them with teachers that can teach them stuff that I can't teach, it's, it's a win for everybody. And so, it just makes sense for me to do that. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's a thing about risks. There's some risks involved. All right. Uh, one of them I already mentioned, don't get consumed, don't get sucked into the rabbit hole. You're in the, you know, if you go in, uh, go in in creator mode. Uh, if you're going in to, into it as a consumer, make sure you're doing that deliberately as well. Uh, because if you're, if you're just doing that habitually because you got nothing else to do or you, you're addicted, you're, you're gonna, it's very easy to lose track of time on social media. It's built to be addictive. So, if you're going on there to promote yourself, go on there to promote yourself. Don't go on there to get addicted to the consumption. Another thing is don't get too attached to any single platform uh, like Instagram. If that's the thing that you, that's where everything is, that's where you live. And not all of a sudden, Instagram is irrelevant, which happens very often with social networks. They come and they go. I remember MySpace. You remember my? Do you remember Friendster? No. <laughs> that was before MySpace. Do you remember Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's coming to that. Yeah, it's it's dying. Maybe they'll be able to survive somehow, but I don't know. It's. It's, it's in dangerous territory right now. Um, I think even Facebook likes Instagram more now. I mean, they own Instagram. I think they're putting okay. more... Facebook owns Instagram and I think they're putting in more resources into Instagram. I, I don't know. But yeah, they come and they go and make sure that when they go, you're not going with them. And so, the way, you know, you, you got to make sure that you're funneling people into your home. S a social network is just a... A hangout club. It, it's it's not where you live. It's not your home. It's just the place you go to hang out. Um, and if it closes down, you could still hang out with your friends somewhere else. So have newsletters. Um, have a website or another port you know portfolio site where you you get people to follow you. That's a little more permanent than social networks. 
and beyond several. So that if one dies, you're not starting over on another. That you could utilize one to grow another at the same time and you're, and you're, you're growing all of them together. Okay, commenters. <laughs> Marshall, you can talk a lot about this one. About commenters? Yeah. You put something out there and now you, and you just get a wall of comments who have a lot of things to say about you. <laughs> what they think about you and that you work and how stupid you are. Well, maybe you don't get that much of that, huh? <laughs> I'm the one that gets that. I get both. I get both. But I have learned though not to read anything twice and to wait a certain amount of time and to read them quickly and take the temperature and then listen to what you or John or Sean or anyone else tells me to pay attention to. Sure. But, but you're still reading them. Yes, I am. I, I, I have read them, yes. And so when, I mean, not, you don't get too many people criticizing you though. So, you, you don't really have that issue. Um, but it's pretty common on the internet. The internet is pretty brutal. People like to criticize each other, sometimes just for the sake of criticizing each other, not even for, for any other reason, just to have fun and hurt someone. I picked that up. <laughs> yeah. So, you have to learn to navigate that field. Um, to ignore that kind of stuff. Know when somebody's critiquing you to help you and when they're criticizing you for their own pleasure. You got to be able to pick up on the difference. And in some cases, it's just obvious. In some cases, it's obvious, yeah. But it's not always obvious and sometimes even if it's obvious, it's still hurtful <laughs> and it's still difficult to ignore, you know? Until you learn to ignore it and you seem to have ignored it really well. The general rule is don't respond to it. You might be hurt by it but just don't respond. There's no point in picking a fight with someone whose purpose is to hurt you. Just walk away. You're not going to get anything out of it. Yeah. I have a friend who is really good at this. Uh, I don't mean on social media, I mean in personal life. And I remember asking him years ago, uh, some people that he worked with that were so intent on harming others and who his life connected to and my life connected to. And I remember him when I mentioned, how do you deal with so-and-so? And he said, he mentioned their name and said, I don't give them two thoughts and changed the subject. And that made a big impression on me that I will give them one thought because it's hard not to, but not a second thought. Because a second thought means that now you have, you have put your hand into the tar. Now you are going to get stuck with it. Does a single thought ever lead to a response though? Uh, oh, with, with him? No, no, with you. If you have a single, if you give each comment a single thought, mm -hmm. does that ever lead to a response? Or you re more, more than a single thought is required for a response? I am committed to not... Uh, unless it's to somebody who is in my life who somebody said the best people to get criticism from are the people who have a stake in your success and failure. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Ooh. that way if they, they, they are not going to flippantly lob criticisms because it could, if they do that and it damages you, it damages them. Yeah. But if they see that there's something you're really doing wrong here, they will come to you with criticism because they are, it's a matter of, of extended protection, self-protection. Yeah. So, those are the people who, who have a stake. If they have a stake in your success and failure and they are criticizing, those are the people to listen. That's, that's that whole thing about parents listen to your kids. Uh, they're not just there to attack the parents. We are part of this family and we're the more vulnerable people of it. So, that is something, both the don't give it two thoughts and they also give it many thoughts if it's someone who or you are co-partnering with and who cares about how things are going. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, but along the lines of comments, uh, with comments though, not just for criticism, but also when people are being nice to you, but just telling you what they would like to see from you. They, yes, they want different. you to be different in a good way, but different. You're, you're going to get people that say, hey, can you do this instead? <laughs> I'd want to see this from you. 
and you're going to you're going to get people who who give you advice and tell you what they want from you from all over the place you're you're going to be pulled in many directions and if you start following that and and you you stray away from what you want to do then you become someone else and that's not good for many reasons i mean art and fear talked about that like we we talked about that um but one of the reasons is that uh, related to growing your audience, the people that followed you because they like you will no longer like you if you change yourself to be like who, someone who wants you to be someone else. So, don't change yourself for this one or a few people that don't like what you're currently doing because the people that like what you're doing won't like you anymore. <laughs> So, this is a person who just comes in and says, I think you should steer the other way. Yeah. And and they grab the steering wheel or they suggest it. And if, if we're listening to someone like that, that again, it's about their personal preference. Yeah. Not about where you're traveling with your people. Yeah. And they're not necessarily trying to hurt you. They might actually be trying to help you like saying, I'm your audience. This is what I want to see. There's nothing wrong with that. You just got to be careful as a creator. Uh, what you choose to do and for whom. And this is where the discernment of listening or not listening to the casual observer yeah, or even the not so casual observer uh, takes discernment. Right. And there's some creators that uh, just get into the habit of constantly going all over the place because they are not they don't really know what they want to do and so they just listen to what everybody else wants them to, to do. Well, that's where reading Steve Jobs' biography <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's where that's where looking at someone who says, I am not listening to you. I'm listening to what I want and people will find out that they want that too because they've got a really strong vision of it. So, anyway, that's that. That's how you grow your audience. Stan, thank you for telling us how you grow your audience. You are teaching something that you have done. This is not theoretical. This is not someone who studied a book about it. This is someone who I have observed now for three years, a little or no, no, seven years, a little more than seven years since 2013. And I've watched you grow your audience. And so, yeah, I'm, I feel privileged to have had the conversation with you. And also, I want to add something in here about what Stan has done. Stan started this out on his own. And he has one person at a time added people to his team with discretion and wisdom and knowing who to add on to his team to take over work that makes your job easier and your company better because you've got people who are doing the work in a way that you couldn't do as well or that they, they, they end up putting the time into it. So, yes, I, I'm glad I got to be a student and I think I did get some things out of this. I think the main thing I got out of this- Frequency. Was the- <laughs> Oh, well, well, no, we have been, with the draftsman thing, we've been keeping up on the frequency, whether we're happy or not. Well, that's, we've been consistent. Consistent, okay. But once a week, yeah, we've, we've been pretty much doing that. Okay. Now, but here's the other thing, is values and priorities of what's important. And I have made up my mind over the years, but very much in this last hour or so, that if I can do the thing Seth Godin was talking about, if I could get my bills paid to have the smallest group possible, maybe a dozen, maybe three, maybe a hundred, the smallest group possible of people who really wanted what I had to offer and who people who I feel invested in, I would be happier with that than to have a bigger audience of people who were not as involved because the, yeah. the watching the growth happen, the, the village thing that goes on where you're, you're involved in it, that's, there's something really satisfying about that. So, that becomes a part of what I put on my whiteboard and uh, becomes a part of how I'm going to navigate when I'm in crises. Cool. What should they put in the comments? Which one thing from all the things I talked about are you going to put into practice right now? That's a good one. Cool. All right, Marshall. See ya. See you next week, Stan.